throughout the 1970s, the average working day has been about eight hours. In the earliest societies, a man and his family had to work just about all their waking hours simply to provide enough food to keep alive. Later, through the use of tools and more advanced forms of technology, they freed themselves from this absolute dependence on the environment, gradually increasing their wealth and reducing their need to work. But one doesn't have to go back to the Stone Age to make this point. Just imagine the lifestyle of a coal miner in the middle of the Industrial Revolution about a hundred years ago. Working under vile and dangerous conditions for up to 16 hours a day, sometimes with his children scrabbling in the depths alongside him, he was still only able to earn enough to eke out a bare existence for himself and his family. Little wonder that Karl Marx was later to cry, workers arise, you have nothing to lose but your chains. Compare with his successor today, still a tough job and no mistake about it. But working conditions and hours which would have seemed like a dream to the miner of the 1820s. A warm, comfortable home, children properly fed, educated and clothed. A personal motor car. Electronic devices of incredible sophistication in the home. Holidays in the sun in remote parts of the world. This isn't to point out how lucky today's miners are but rather to indicate the stupendous improvement that's taken place in their standard of living. And all of it due to the Industrial Revolution, the coming of the machines, and the vast affluence that they've brought. mechanical muscles which the Victorians invented and put to such good use triggered off the Industrial Revolution, which in turn led to a huge expansion in the wealth of those societies which were touched by it. This, despite the fact that many people once feared that machines would decrease employment and lower living standards. The problem was that people couldn't see what those workers displaced by the machines would do, who would employ them. Where would they get their money? Much the same arguments are being applied today to the microprocessor revolution. The microprocessor is a machine with a difference. It's a tiny, tiny computer, which unlike other machines, amplifies the power of men's brains, whereas previous machines amplified the power of their muscles. Unlike the machines that made the Industrial Revolution, they're extremely cheap to mass produce. They also use up virtually no raw materials, hardly any fuel, and they're totally non-polluting. In fact, they can be used in absolutely enormous numbers all over the place and at very little cost. projects like the Voyager, with their vastly increased computer power, were beginning to map the surface of the planets. And all this signifies far-reaching changes in our technology. An excellent example of the dramatic pace of change is if we take a, a common contemporary object like this uh, relatively cheap watch, costs about $50 all over America, 25 pounds. Now it's got several functions, a bleeper alarm, a stopwatch, a liquid crystal display and all that. This in itself is amazing, but perhaps the most remarkable thing is if we go back to, say, the first Apollo 
lunar landing in 1969, uh, which one thinks of as very advanced technology and also as fairly recent technology, the astronauts on that flight would simply have failed to understand this watch. They wouldn't have known how to operate it, and they certainly wouldn't have had any idea how it might have worked. I think it's very difficult to think of a better example of the dramatic pace of change. But on a more basic level, the chip is now appearing in supermarkets. In America, all products are now marked with special stripes, allowing them to be scanned by a laser beam. At the cash desk, the goods are simply passed over a laser scan device connected to a computer. It makes the cashier's job faster and more efficient. It registers the product sold, the price, and updates the store's stock account. And one day, in the not too distant future, the man from the gas or electricity board will arrive at your home, not simply to read your meter, but armed with his portable, pre-programmed mini-computer, will calculate your bill and hand it to you there and then. Thank you very much. Thank you. In schools, the power of the chip will begin to help with personal tuition. Just tear it the way it is. I, be all right. I don't need any more paper. Okay. okay. Right. Right. Whilst in hospitals, the chip at your bedside will help the doctor with instant diagnosis. Industrial uses have now brought the power of the microchip onto the shop floor. Here, a skilled operator literally teaches the robot to do the job, with the microcomputer recording every action. The action replay, now minus the operator, carries on as before, and this kind of application is ideal for hazardous, repetitive, or simply unpleasant work. The enormous power and flexibility of the microprocessor works for the architect and the town planner. They can instantly see the effects of their development on the environment. But its extraordinary versatility for many people poses a threat. In the newspaper world, the Times dispute brought this whole issue to a head. Here at the Nottingham Evening Post, this technology has been in use for some years. The technique is word processing. Instead of the story being typeset in metal by teams of craftsmen, the reporter now types a story directly into a computer. Simply by touching the keyboard, she can alter her spelling, grammar, and in fact anything she likes. Once the story is complete, it's automatically stored in the central computer. When he needs the story, the editor, with his own terminal, calls it up, adds his own changes, headlines, and so on. The edited version is then typeset into normal typographic layout and printed in the usual way. The point about this technology is the speed and flexibility which allows for rapid changes to the editions during the day. In fact, this paper prints nine editions daily compared with the two or three published by our national papers. Inevitably, this is going to put people out of work and the effects are likely to be far-reaching. So the problem facing us now is the creation of completely new industries where the microprocessor functions positively for a working society. In fact, the range of brain-like tasks the microchip can perform is going to increase steadily in the years ahead. Like transposing your favorite tune into a musical score. But what are the facts about the microprocessor? In what way will it actually affect employment in the coming years? Well, the first word that springs to everybody's mind in this context is, of course, robots. The robot has a prominent place in science fiction literature and movies. Basically, it's a man made out of Meccano parts, which stumbles around doing man-like things, flashing its eyes and engaged in stilted tinny conversation. 
Apart from hints that it has special strength or unusual weapons, it's generally looked upon as a kind of cumbersome, rather inferior version of Homo sapiens. In fact, entertainment apart, it's hard to think why anyone would ever bother to make one. But that's really based on a misunderstanding of the meaning of the word robot. To understand what we mean by it, we need to realize that there are essentially three types of machines. This is the simplest kind. It's all muscle, an extension of its driver's muscles. And it can only work as long as he's here to guide it. Even if you switch it on, it won't do anything sensible without a human in its seat. This is the second type of machine, a programmable one. It adds its own mechanical muscles, but it can also go through a sequence of actions according to one or possibly a large number of predetermined patterns. But although this looks very clever, the machine itself is really very unintelligent. It's a dumb machine to use computer parlance. This sequence of actions it goes through may be complex, but it will go on doing them however inappropriate they may be. In the end roving chamber, where the blocks are coated with icing, cooled and decorated. Here's a good example. Remember this marvelous film about industrial relations, I'm All Right, Jack? Remember where Ian Carmichael visits a factory making chocolate bars? This is my favorite machine. Is there anything wrong, old man? Oh, my hands! Pretty overwhelming, isn't it? Come on, round the other side. And here we have the coated blocks, soft, milky, delicious. All ready for stamping with the walnut and the cherry. Now all that remains is to wrap them, pack them, dispatch them. There we are. Though this may seem like an example of automation in its silliest form, you'll notice that the machine isn't all that stupid. For example, it gives the bowler hat more than one cherry and arranges them neatly into a pattern. Seen everything, my boy? In the movie, it's just a joke, of course. Of course but this would really make it a robot rather than a dumb machine. For the essence of a robot, is that it not only performs mechanical tasks more easily or more rapidly than a human, but it also guides itself to some extent, modifying its behavior according to what it senses in the world around it. Okay. Okay, investigate it and resolve it for me, okay? Oh. Right, bye bye. Okay. <laughs> it's robots like this performing tasks which have hitherto been reserved for specially trained and skilled humans that will kick the computer revolution into being by increasing productivity and efficiency dramatically they'll accelerate the trend towards a more affluent less work dependent society the economic consequences of this are enormous Countries which get in quickly on the robot revolution will reap tremendous rewards. Those who lag back will become steadily less competitive in just the way that those countries which missed out on the industrial revolution remained locked into medieval standards of living. Some countries are already committed to massive investment in industrial robots, and amongst them is Italy, with a robot-built Fiat using this technology to its utmost. industrialized country that wants to maintain its living standards in the 1980s, let alone the 1990s, is going to have to look at robots and their possibilities quickly.
But now, let's consider one of the most sensational consequences of the microprocessor revolution, the disappearance of money. This pound note and this dollar bill are useful bits of paper because they allow us to buy the things that we want. But that's all they are, really, just bits of paper. A printed record of the fact that their owner has contributed something to his society. In primitive societies, people simply exchange one form of goods for another. But barter doesn't really work where people have nothing to exchange but their specialist skills. To meet this need, money came into being. Beginning as chunks of precious metal, money developed into tokens, then coins, and finally, paper banknotes. The banknote is still only a piece of paper with writing on it. And for thousands of years, of course, that's been the only way of making a permanent record. But it's a very inefficient one. All the paper's got to be bought, then it's got to be printed, then it's got to be distributed and guarded, and in due course, replacements have got to be issued. And it's also extremely vulnerable to theft. In the past few years, the computer has appeared and provided a completely different and far more efficient approach. What this amounts to is that instead of making a mark on a bit of paper saying one pound, we make an electronic mark a million times smaller in a computer's memory. And we indicate alongside it, also in the form of a minute electronic signal, who owns the sum of money recorded. The record, electronic rather than physical, sits there until someone wants to look at it or wants to arrange for it to be transferred elsewhere. What happens now if one wants to transfer money from one business to another is that computer A changes its own record appropriately, sends a message to computer B, which makes its own amendments. It's as simple as that. No mail, no danger of theft, and the transaction completed at the speed of light and at a fraction of the cost. The earliest experiments in using the new electronic money, for that's what it is, actually began about 20 years ago when those funny symbols appeared on the base of checkbooks. Hardly anyone realized that they were the first steps in the move to a totally cashless society. The next step came with credit cards, and many of you will have one or more of these. They too are a sort of printed record of your wealth, but unlike coins and notes, they're not interchangeable. How would you like to pay, sir? Access card, please. At the moment, the card really just identifies its owner. He wants to make a purchase, so the assistant writes down the details, and the document is popped through the post in the usual way. Hardly worth the effort. Why not use a cheque or good old-fashioned cash? Well, that was just a halfway house. The next step involves just you and a distant computer. You punch in your personal code number. It checks to see if your card is valid and if there's enough money in your account. And if there is, it okays the deal and in this case, pays out in traveler's checks. The whole transaction is concluded in seconds. Throughout the 1980s, the process already underway will gather pace, and by the 1990s, money as we know it, and as it has existed for thousands of years, may be totally redundant. There will be some surprising consequences, some good, some slightly sinister. Bank raids crop up pretty frequently these days, and crime flourishes because hard cash is easily transferable and difficult to trace. But the shift from cash to electronic money will gradually reduce this kind of thing, because electronic money will pass not from hand to hand, but from computer to computer. However, this is leading to some funny trends. In America, police are already beginning to notice a shift of muggers' attention from the wealthy, whose pockets are likely to be lined with treacherous credit cards, to the poor, who paradoxically are more likely to carry cash. Soon there won't even be any point in the theft of goods or precious items. What are you going to do with them when you've stolen them? 
they won't be exchangeable for negotiable anonymous cash. Amazing though it may seem, by the time we get to the 1990s, the crime of theft, as we know it today, may have vanished. For some time, coins will probably still circulate to allow small transactions to take place. But even this use will die away as people find the carrying of cash less and less convenient. Already in many cities, public transport and telephones require tokens purchased in advance. But for anyone who doubts the remorseless spread of the credit card, take a look at this New York taxi cab. Okay, fine. This will do nicely. How much is that? 825, sir. Okay, can you give me American Express? Yes, sir. Okay. Sign it, please. You have to sign it. Yes, Thank sir. you very much. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good day. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. The net effect of this should be to make everyone, criminals accepted, of course, a good deal wealthier, and certainly make life a whole lot more pleasant, and all because of electronic money. But will it be totally beneficial? On the surface, one might think so, but there are one or two smoke signals which one shouldn't ignore. Credit cards may be very convenient for both the user and the banks, but they also have a funny way of keeping tabs on what you do. Wherever you go, whatever you buy, the card pins you down. Pouring information back into its central computer. And soon, cards will not just be a convenience, but an absolute essential. Increasingly, we're moving towards a cashless society. These French stores have been directly linked to a local bank. A specially issued card can be used in neighborhood shops and your account automatically debited. So, if your bank balance isn't up to par, you could be in trouble. This principle is already being used in a very advanced way at Citibank in New York, where you have a choice of services, all relayed to the computer through a small keyboard and television screen. You insert your magnetic card, tap in your personal code number, and the computer asks you which services you require. In this case, he wants to deposit some money. The computer recognizes the customer and automatically updates his account. In the computerized world of the 80s, and in particular the 90s, it's going to become extremely difficult to buy anything, to go anywhere, even to do anything, without one's own form of personal identifier. Chances are this will come in the form of a credit card with perhaps a built-in microprocessor which recognizes its owner somehow and makes it virtually useless to anyone else. This personal identifier might even come built into a watch, or possibly even a signet ring. All very convenient and useful, of course, provided that we don't mind the computers knowing where we are and what we're doing at just about any moment. But are we sure that we aren't going to bitterly resent that kind of perpetual computer surveillance, no matter how benevolent it is? Well, that's the kind of question we're going to have to face up to in the 1980s. And there are obviously political and social questions of equal magnitude as well. Join us in the next program to consider some of them.